Uh, good morning. Welcome. I'm Frank Kaufman. I'm the head of the uh, Professor's World Peace Academy, and uh, we're excited to have our next guest in the uh, PWPA interview series in which we interview scholars worldwide. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Craig Considen. Uh, Dr. Considen is a, a scholar, professor, global speaker, media contributor, and public intellectual based at the Department of Sociology at Rice University. He is the author of many books and articles. Dr. Considen's opinions have been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, BBC, CBS, Fox News, MSNBC, Newsweek, and Al Jazeera. He has been invited to speak at some of the leading international organizations and universities in the world. Dr. Considin is also visible on social media. He holds a PhD from Trinity College, University of Dublin, Masters of Science from Royal Holloway, University of London, and his Bachelor of Arts from American University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Considin is U.S. born. He's a Catholic of Irish and Italian descent. Please join me to welcome to this interview, Dr. Craig Considin. Uh, we've set a little time aside to discuss some of the issues raised in, is this your most recent book? Uh, it's The Humanity of Muhammad, A Christian View. Yeah, that's the, that's the latest one. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it's, um, it was actually, a version of it was actually, I don't think I told you this, but it was actually published in, uh, in Indonesia <laughs> originally. And oh. then uh, I did some significant work to the book and then got it uh, published by Blue Dome Press, which is uh, based in New Jersey. Outstanding, outstanding. Yeah, the, uh, our listeners will have, the, will have the link and the way to get it. Uh, I've, I've greatly enjoyed reading it and uh, encourage uh, our listeners to pick it up. It's, it's a quick read. Uh, I had a famous, uh, a famous uh, writer I enjoyed when I was a student named, I forget his first initials, but it was Bainton. Hmm. Uh, he was a historian who made, uh, who wrote, it seemed so simply, but it re represented a tremendous depth of knowledge. And it's, it's often the case that the people with the greatest depth of knowledge are the ones that are able to communicate most simply. So this book of yours is one that is easy to read and easy to understand, but it shouldn't be mistaken as superficial in any way. It reflects a lot of research and that's great. I mean, that's like one of the, as an author and uh, a scholar, I mean, that's like one of the best. Um, um, Endorsement. Yeah, you know, because I don't want to simply be the type of scholar that has this knowledge, but is unable to communicate it in a way that anyone can really understand. And like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily deliberately do that, but I, I think that's just the way I, it, that's the way it comes out. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm blessed for that um, because I've heard that before, you know, people oh, have said mm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great talent and it's especially important as uh, at least so it's said, and it seems to be that attention spans are, are <laughs> contracting. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Uh, it's a great uh, talent, especially to when, it, as I say, right, people's attention spans are uh, talent are contracting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, William F. Buckley said that he'll never write an article in which every reader doesn't have to look up at least one word, but I think this is, I think this is a different age. He had a different mission than uh, Definitely. getting important news out. Um, I'm, I didn't realize that the book was initially published in uh, Indonesia. I've spent a lot of time there. It's one of Yes. And um, um, uh, I, for, I can't even believe the, the former president there uh, was a, one of the great champions of, uh, of uh, broad-minded uh, Islam, a very courageous uh, 
man and uh he was he was my host most often there oh that's awesome yeah, yeah. They, the, the publishing house uh it's called nura books and they are part of mizan publishing which is kind of like a penguin you know the the equivalent of our penguin book publishing Very good. Mm. and what they did like they reached out to me um in maybe 2016 and at the time i was blogging for the huffington post and Nora came to me and said, we want to take all of your Huffington Post articles and all your blog posts and basically just put it into a book format. Oh, I see. And we yeah. did and we did that. And, you know, I, you, I changed it up a little bit. And then people were like, is this book in English? And I was like, it's it's not. It's only in Indonesian. And then I made the decision to, um, you know, continue to kind of revamp it. And then voila, it becomes the, the humanity of Muhammad, a Christian view. Very good. Very good. Okay. That's good background. Uh, there, I was embarrassed when I can remember the name of somebody I'm claiming was a friend, but uh, <laughs> it's because he had he had a, nick, a beloved nickname that everybody knew him as, and this was my confusion. But it's, it was President Abdul Rahman Wahid. He was yeah. uh, uh, the president of uh, one of the, I think, the, the most populous Muslim nation in the world, or possibly right. second to India, maybe. I'm not sure which. And, uh, and a, very, a very important, a very important uh, uh, balance to, I would say, Middle East or Saudi uh, societies. And, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I so think I mentioned the um, Indonesian constitution in, in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I kind of juxtapose it exactly with what you just said, Frank, the, the Saudi constitution, which is basically exclusive and... Uh, the Indonesian constitution actually reads in a similar manner to our own constitution in the United States with separation of church of, uh, and state, freedom mm -hmm. of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience. All of these things I think are really fundamental in 2020 to any, um, any nation that wants to be prosperous. I think there are certain things that just need to be there and freedom of religion is definitely one of the, the requisites, I think. Yeah. And also the other big thing in Indonesia, I believe anyway, is that is the commitment to women's rights and women's education mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, just to the, to the far reaches, you know, just as far as you can drive. And then when you got to get out of your car and walk, then, then still that village or those women will be educated and, uh, it was a big commitment in Indonesia, which I believe really makes a society, you know, as you say, to be prosperous. Exactly. Um, so that's great. Uh, and then just before we dive into the content, um, in, in your introduction, I read that you, you've been invited to speak on, uh, and I, the long list from the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. And then in this long list, you include... Fox News, and just on the other side of the comma is MSNBC. Mm -hmm. And so I thought maybe your next book <laughs> can be on, the, on, on reconciling that. I don't know which would be harder. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, the reason why I, I include both Fox and MSNBC is to try to give people the impression, again, that, um, well, it's not really an impression. I mean, I, I do try to reach everyone you know like i'm not one of the uh, individuals that i think we're seeing a lot of these days it's like they just immediately um you know denounce or separate themselves from an entity like uh, fox or msnbc because of the political baggage that they have and right. mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm really trying to um get into those type of spaces because i think it's an it's important to um Oh, it's fantastic! Engage. Yeah, to it's engage. absolutely fantastic. If uh, if you can get this, it, that you're invited there is really a big, is very hopeful, quite honestly, and it's also a testament to the balance of your posture and position. Uh, I'm just going to give very quickly. Um, the book is broke down very, very simply, very cleanly, and that's one of the reasons why it's so easy to follow. Uh, there's six chapters and a conclusion, and you speak on religious pluralism. That's a classical, a classical issue on the on the varieties of ways that one can advocate how religious 
religions should relate to each other. Pluralism is one of them. Uh, and you could go all the way from uh, supersessionism. You know, there's, there's every imaginable way that you can define that relationship. And the secular one is disregarding religious commitments altogether. Uh, then you talk about the civic nation and state building. That has to do with how religion is related to the state. You speak on racism. You speak on education in the fourth chapter, seeking knowledge, women's rights. And uh, I would say per, the chapter is called, the sixth chapter is called the golden rule. And I would say just uh, human, uh, personal and social uh, position vis-a-vis -vis our interactions with others. I don't know if that's a fair summary. I think so. Okay. So, uh, so for those of us who will be getting the book and reading it, we, we know that we have these basic categories to understand, I'd say more primarily, uh, I'd say a little bit weighted to, to learning more the, uh, the Muslim positions on these things because people here in the West may not be as clear on those, uh, but there's a balance throughout. So um, to start, uh, you, to, in the introduction to the book, it, it seems like part of what puts you on this path, because you're a good Catholic, good Catholic boy, Irish and Italian, you know, it's like, yeah. it's it's like the, the stereotype from Boston. Yeah, it's yeah. like if I walk down the block and knock on any door, that's likely to <laughs> open the door here where I am. And, uh, and so, uh, so it's not a typical, it's not a typical thing necessarily that, not that you won't, but that, that, the people I'm, whose not, doors I'm going to knock on is not going to tell me a lot about Islam. And there's some stuff that happened to you that was seminal in kind of turning you toward this particular uh, dedication and devotion and curiosity. And you describe your experience at the time of the 9-11 tragedy, the bombing of uh, these four or five sites in the, US, in the United States. And, and then... An immediate, an immediate encounter in your class right that day, and then somehow tied to a later experience under an, under an educator and a professor in uh, American University. Do you want to do you want to set that up for us a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So nine eleven had a really huge impact on my life, even though I didn't feel that at the time. You know, like my kind of revelation on the impact that 9-11 had on me, I didn't feel or recognize that until much later, you know, four or five years later. But the town I grew up in, in Boston, is, you know, pretty homogenous, even still to this day. I mean, there's like 98% Christian. We actually have a pretty sizable Jewish community as well. And, you know, predominantly white, so 98% white. And really had no context whatsoever for an event like 9-11 and especially the media coverage that was coming out of it. So, you know, we saw a pretty carefully crafted narrative around terrorism and linking terrorism to, you know, a, a faith tradition and then a people. And as a young, you know, as a, as a teenager, it was really difficult to kind of make sense of jihad and, and Sharia and Al Qaeda, some of these big buzzwords, because no one had taught us about these things mm. in my public high school. You know, like we didn't learn about Islamic history. We didn't learn about Muhammad. And in Catholic school, I went to St. Sebastian's Catholic Church in Needham, and we really had absolutely no interfaith anything. Like I, I cannot remember it ever being taught to us. So, you know, I think I kind of fell down the the trap. I like to kind of refer to it as a as a trap. And I think a lot of Americans also fell into the trap of kind of thinking that Islam is a monolith and it's associated with these terrible things that we see in the media. So I became interested really in trying to figure out why something like 9-11 happened. Like, what is, why do these people, meaning Muslims, like, why did they do this? Why do they hate us? Because, you know, President Bush was even saying 
they they attacked us because they hated our freedoms they hated our way of life and i was like man that's that's pretty intense so i go to college trying to be a uh a citizen a patriotic citizen in the intelligence uh arena so i was in dc i was like okay cia fbi nsa i wanted to get involved in that maybe state department and you know thankfully thank god i had a brilliant professor akbar ahmed a great man a brilliant anthropologist and scholar very well respected especially in the interfaith realm and that's what really kind of sold that's what sold me on his mission it was this idea of really bringing people together that some people believe are sworn enemies these groups of people jews muslims christians and so on and you know by the grace of god really it was just it just connected with me uh, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of faith in him and I really believed in what he was saying and I trusted him. And I guess the rest is kind of history. You know, I often mm. tell people if I had walked into a classroom in 2004 at American university, and let's say the professor had certain inclinations when he talks about the Islamic tradition or Muhammad, I could have easily remained in the trap you know it could have been quite easy to continue on this um this mental framework that pitches the clash of civilizations uh, yes yes mm -hmm. i had professor ahmed and um wow. he really provided the foundation to um allow me to to go off on my own really so he's he's mm -hmm. a great a great man well, well, I I know him and I've worked with him. I, I agree with you, uh, but what you are saying should be a, a tremendous inspiration for teachers and educators. Uh, that you never know where you're going to make a difference, and you never know which of your students is going to become an extension of the simple hopes that you have as a teacher. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that just hearing that alone, because, you know, at the professional level, when you're doing in a religious work or something like that, you'll have these colleagues. I, I have him as a colleague and um, have worked with him and you naturally recognize each other for e each other's strengths. But just to hear a phrase like that and the tremendous influence he had on you is really significant, especially for teachers and educators. I'm, I'm happy to hear this more. more. Uh, now, um, this, is not, this is not closely related to your book, but just uh, quickly, um, I, I think you must be aware that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there was a tremendous amount of solidarity with the United States from almost the entire Muslim world. Did you, is that known to did you ever yeah. think like, yes correct yeah i mean i think we were praying in the national cathedral there yeah. were there there was there was an explosion of solidarity across religious lines definitely and right? like even heads of pretty much every head of state in the world muslim non-muslim whatever condemned it and they were all yeah they were all right there with us you know hand in hand um, and then kind of fell apart, I think. Right. So, so somehow right there, an enormous opportunity was lost. Something, this was an enormous opportunity that, that even though these are massive tragedies and th thousands of lives lost, if, if there could have been that, that energy remained following the tragedy, it would have been at a small cost to harmonize the centuries-long clash between Christian and Muslim cultures, right? I mean, yeah. this was, we were on the verge of something. I know, it's a, almost um, a lot, it's a lost opportunity in a way. And if, yeah. you, if you think about like how different the world would have been, because the response that, you know, 9-11, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, a horrific, tragic event that I think 
still is painful for people. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it, the response was really questionable if I could put it that way. Um, and it was, it was really, it was really damaging um, not only to a lot of innocent, you know, people, but I don't think our response was good for our nation either. Correct. You know? I agree with you. Yeah. There, so something, something happened and it's almost to me anyway, it's almost as though it's actually the decisions vis-a-vis -vis Iraq that is more where like it, uh, your work is to really diminish the unnecessary and self-destructive habit of hate across religious lines. But to me, it, it seems more the child of decisions on Iraq than reaction to 9-11. We, we were all together for a moment. It, 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 had, it had somehow, it, it was left in the hands of extremists. We, it was recognized as such. Nobody painted all of Islam with that at first. Yeah, and I think, um, I think it was like 10 days after 9-11, President Bush went to the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C., right on Massachusetts Ave. It was right. actually the first mosque I've, I've ever been to, and I went with Professor Ahmed. And, you know, if you actually read the text of, <clears throat> excuse me, of George Bush's speech, it's actually quite good. But right. his actions following, you know, in the years to come, right. greatly contradicted Exactly. His, his message. And, you know, I think with Afghanistan, I do think, and again, a lot of this can be kind of fact-checked and verified. Um, I think most of the world was okay with going into Afghanistan. Iraq was a completely different story, though. That, I think... That's correct. Yeah, I agree with you. Just, um, yeah. There was... Well, this, yeah, there was... Go a, ahead. I think a lot of people just interpreted the U.S.'s move as just um, a grab, you know, a yep. power grab. And it's, it's really, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. A thousand, a thousand tragedies were born in that. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, so back to, back to um, uh, your work. And, uh, and so this kind of little, little kind of, walk through just a touch of your of your uh, of your experience especially with your professor and the trajectory how a sudden almost about face on your direction of your life and from that point onward you become you become a highly effective and very committed apologist uh, some some uh, you you defend the concept of being a Muslim apologist, which I which I like. I like the proper use of words, and and an apologist is a great uh, word when properly understood. But in a way, you're an, an apologist for the right relations among religions, uh, mm -hmm. rather than an apologist for one religion or the other. Is right. is is that a way? Is that po a kind of true? Yeah, I like I like the way that you've you've kind of mm -hmm. framed it, and you know. Sometimes people will send me a message and, and say, you know, why do you, why do you defend Islam so much? Or like, why do you speak so highly of it? Um, and for me, you know, engaging in this work is really simply a vehicle for defending, preserving, promoting humanity. Like for me, right. you know, Islam and Christianity are are religions in, in some ways quite specific, but really humanity is something is, is something greater and it's something bigger. And I suppose I'm an apologist for that too. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. ultimately that, you know, we, we, we need to see each other more as humans. And I think oftentimes less as a Muslim, or a Christian, because I think we tend to box people into categories, you know, like, so yeah. you're Muslim or you're, you're Brown or you're Latino or you're African American. And mm -hmm. I often say in interfaith circles, I'm like, what if we really changed the entire discourse and we started seeing people as um, fathers 
and mothers mm. or children and neighbors. And I, I really think that would really like shake up um, things in a, in a good way. And we become kind of, um, we become less tribal. So for me, it's really about, um, it's about humanity, you know, and another term, um, Frank, that people are, are starting um, to use when they talk about my work, because I get these messages on social media, they, they refer to me as a perennialist. And I mm. actually was unfamiliar with this term up mm. until like a month ago. And it's a, it's a proper kind of philosophy, if you want to call it that. That is, And nice. I actually am, I, you know, I, I read it and I'm like, well, yeah, I, I, I think I am a perennialist <laughs> if you want to, if you yeah. want to kind of lump me into a, into a category. And then <laughs> I was really happy to read too, that um, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a perennialist. And I talk about Ralph Waldo uh, Emerson in the book alongside Rumi. And yes. Emerson was someone who, when I was going through this kind of transformation, when I got to college 1920, in the summers when I was back home in Massachusetts, I would just read so much Emerson. And I mm. loved it. I absolutely oh, loved right. the transcendental movement. So, yeah. yeah, humanity. That's what it's all about, Frank. Very good. Very good. I just had an inspiration that uh, as you were speaking, when uh, when you said, I wish we'd just describe ourselves as human. And then I thought, um, what if what if we use these terms as adjectives rather than as identities? So you say, I said, well, what if you said, I, uh, like I'm a Muslim father or I'm a Muslim brother. I, at first I thought I'm a Muslim human being so that uh, it would always be a descriptive. And so you'd have to focus on the core identity. So like whenever that. you meet someone, you say, oh, I'm a Christian human being. And that if you're, if you're using the, the qualifier to uh, uh, categorize, then, then you've erred. Like if you said, I'm a six foot human being, but then you took it immediately further that if every time we ever were asked our identity we'd say oh i'm a muslim son or a muslim husband or something like that yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's some there's something that might be helpful in the framework uh, uh for the beginning of how we think about relate with one another and think about one another yes definitely um so what i had in my notes is that as we move toward this advocacy of of uh, advocating a wholesome, healthy, and even and in your own your own advocacy, loving you even make a distinction over against tolerance, which I'll raise in a second. Actually, loving the views and positions of the other, uh, and we already touched on this a little prior. I I I don't want the listeners to think I'm talking to just some naive person who's been, you know, who's been. Uh, hoodwinked. Uh, and so your book does, ex does uh, account very clearly for the kind of grotesque barbarism and kind of haunting violence mm -hmm. that is presented as faithful interpretation of Islam that we see in the world today. You mentioned specific cases. Uh, do I, is that a fair read? Have I got, it's in your book. You, you're yeah. not naive to. No, definitely not. And you know, you, you can't dismiss these things and you, you know, that they're in the news, they have an impact on how people see the world and you have to address them and we can't dismiss it. I mean, some of these atrocities, um, especially in light of, you know, ISIS, um, yes. was they had a run there of three or four years mm -hmm. and it was just really um, shocking. And what was amazing for me was Professor John Andrew Morrow's book, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of His Time. It was released, it was published in 2013. Mm. And I, I talk about the book, uh, Morrow's book in, in my own book. And yes. what these covenants are saying is that essentially all Christians within a territory that is essentially run by Muslims are not only granted freedom of religion, but they are protected. And it says things that even if a church were to fall into disrepair, the Muslims are 
obligated to repair that church, right? So yeah, these covenants are coming out because of John's book. And then you turn on the news and you see ISIS like destroying churches. Yes. And then I started thinking, well, okay, we, we need to do something about this. We need to lift um, Muhammad's message to make sure that um, people aren't associating the destruction of churches with his teachings and the faith tradition of over, you know, a quarter of the human population. Right. Right. So, so you really, you really have your work cut out for you due to the prevalence of grotesque, grotesque misinterpretations of the tradition. Uh, And, and the curiosity of course is, that those people, like the, I forget the name of the caliph of ISIS, um, Abu, Abu Al, uh, Baghdadi, Al, Al Baghdadi, Al Baghdadi, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, every other, every other uh, syllable out of his mouth is is the Quran. Uh, correct them. Yeah, uh, they, they present themselves as as scholars, as learned, as they speak gently and quietly. They're you know they don't. You know, they're not maniacs frothing at the mouth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you really have your work cut out for you when someone has taken the tradition which you so elegantly present for its, for its beauty, uh, for, its, for its response to racism, for its response to inequality, for its response to religious discrimination. You, you bring out the core teachings in the tradition and then you have people who are very, I don't know, I wouldn't call them learned, I don't know what to call them, but they've created quite a tapestry out of the very tradition that, that uh, you're saying is peaceful. That's a very big challenge. for. Uh, it's a huge challenge. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are obviously moments where you're just like, is it, is it working? Um, I actually recently had an experience based on the position I took on Hagia Sophia. So I was for the Hagia Sophia remaining a museum. Yes, me too. Because I was concerned that all of the historic, you know, animosities would be reignited if it turned into a church or if it turned into a a mosque. That's, that's correct. And um, so what happened with me was not, you know, um, Islamophobes, if you want to call it that, or Christian bigots attacking me or, or anything like that. I was actually getting backlash from Muslims. And this is something that I've actually noticed a little bit more in recent years due to my work is like this first started off by getting attacks um, from people who didn't like Muslims. But then I I was also recently being attacked um, by Muslims for the position that I took. And like people were not only attacking my position, but they were attacking me um, as a, as a Christian. Right. Your right to have any view or something. Exactly. You know, like, I mean, the whole cancel culture uh, Mm -hmm. topic, which is kind of in the news. And like, I was basically, in some people's minds, I was worthy of being canceled because of my position. So for me, when I saw the anti-Christian, anti-American, and even anti-white comments via social media, I started questioning whether I'm actually effective in what I'm doing. You know? mm-hmm. So like the, 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 the tension and the conflict comes from multiple angles. Yes. And it comes from, you know, various, various groups. And I think it was difficult to kind of digest the response to Hagia Sophia. It, it made me feel like, you know, because I do speak a lot on social media about Muhammad. And, you know, I think a lot of people would say I'm, I'm praising his teachings. And then so people like when I post these things, but then when I take a position that they don't like, not, they, they attack me and they make it personal. So how do I reach I these people too? You know, how do I, mm-hmm. how do I reach the people that um, are able to not only respect the content that I'm putting out, but me, me as a person, as a as a as a Christian, 
you know, so it's, it's difficult. Uh, yeah, it's not easy. Well, I, I, I express sympathy because uh, it's painful. It's painful when at, it's almost, it's a little bit of a cautionary tale. Oh, we're so excited that you've learned about the prophet and, uh, and then somehow the honeymoon's over mm-hmm. and suddenly it's, you know, how dare you? And, uh, exactly. You're uh, absolutely uh, right. Yeah. 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 And then the, um, the middle ground, the middle ground will draw iron from both sides. That's normal. And, uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that I think, I think everybody of goodness and of kindness has to, has to um, come to terms with the, the nastiness of what social media has, uh, what is it, the word, like kind of re- released on the world or something like that. It's, it, it has its own, it has its own, what do you call it, it's nature, yeah. that social media itself will, will be the occasion of just uh, all kinds of la- bad, bad ways of, of pr- behaving. Mm-hmm. It's the nature of, of the media where you think you're conversing with someone and it's not even really a person right there. It's almost an avatar. Yep. And it's and and it's not even and it's not even conversation. So anyway, I wish you a lot of and you don't need it. You're you know, you're uh, kind of uh, loved by God and the spirit. So you will get through it. But I do wish you a lot of fortitude you. in this highly partisan uh, universe. And uh, you've taken on some very big challenges. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, one of the things, so in your efforts to advocate for uh, a way in which believing Christians and believing Muslims uh, find a way not just to tolerate each other, but to actually love one another and even love one another's teachings, uh, you settle upon the option of pluralism and have an entire chapter de- dedicated to that. Pluralism is a very, and then, and more recently you've discovered the, uh, the uh, philosophical concept of perennialism, yeah. which is a closely related concept. The, the writer who really, the writer who really um, uh, made perennialism part of, the fabric of of thought is Houston Smith. Okay. Uh, so when was he? Come across, was, was he? Uh, he was. He he passed away about a decade ago, uh, and he wrote some of the seminal some of the seminal writing during the time when no one believed more than one religion could. There was it was in a period in which only one religion was true, whichever one yours was. And uh, and Houston Smith began to introduce. He's kind of the father of comparative, not beyond comparative religions, but uh, religious studies. And uh, he he uh, wrote out of a perennialist um, uh, personal piety. So that'll that'll be interesting for you, especially since people are starting to <laughs> brand. He's one of the greatest guys in our lifetime. Awesome. So, I, I, that, so that, that, yeah, that, you're in good company. Yeah, that, that name rings a bell for sure. And mm-hmm. like, I don't, you know, I think Emerson, as I mentioned, is considered a perennialist, but I don't think he directly used that term. So I, I'm guessing um, Professor Smith probably kind of helped bring it all into like a coherent uh, field or area. Yeah, especially as it applies to distinctly existing historical religions per se, mm. which was not Emerson's uh, focus, if I'm correct. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's the, that's the difference there. So, uh, so on, on the issue of pluralism, it's a very exact way of relating. And I'm wondering if you, if you feel like saying a word about that. In the in the whole field of possible ways religions can be related to one another. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, yeah, would you like to? Yeah, of course. Um, mm. So, my views on pluralism are really um, founded upon the work of Harvard scholar uh, Diana Eck yes. and the Pluralism Project at Harvard. And yeah. 
in short, Professor Eck is saying that religious tolerance and tolerating the other is not good enough or necessarily healthy for a society that is as diverse as the United States. And she's kind of postulating that tolerance kind of allows stereotypes to reproduce because it's a very surface way of being like a, a friend, you know, it's like, well, um, you know, you can do what you want and you can, you can do that and that's okay. But like, we're not gonna, uh, really get to know you. We don't really want to understand you. And Eck is mm. saying that what we need is the energetic engagement with religious diversity. And that's essentially what pluralism is. So I frame it as a way of living. It's a way of behaving. Pluralism is not necessarily, um, the way I frame it, it's not necessarily linked to theology, this idea that all religions have a a stake in the truth. I believe in that anyways, but pluralism for me is literally, you know, it's an it's an active process of actually God. going into, yeah, going into communities, going into neighborhoods, going into businesses and schools where there is religion or religious diversity, and then you kind of get unfamiliar, you get uncomfortable, but you learn, and it's um it's a way of educating oneself, and like I like mm -hmm. to use um. I don't think I mentioned this in the book, but I often use it in my talks um, to give people a way of activating pluralism. I refer to it as deuce. So um, deuce as like the, the peace sign um, and it stands for, it's an acronym. It stands for dialogue, education, understanding, commitment, and engagement. So mm. we activate pluralism in this way. It starts with um, dialogue, right? So it starts with, not necessarily diving into religious texts immediately, but again, going to the human level, talking about what it's like to live in a neighborhood. What is it like to live um, in a certain country or to be part of a certain profession? So you kind of break the ice. And then once you've developed trust and rapport, then you move to the E, which is education. This is where you really can start kind of um, getting into the deeper, potentially more uh, contentious issues between faith traditions. And then once you go through the educational process, then you understand. And that's when, you know, you really start seeing eye to eye. You may not agree with necessarily everything that another religious community is saying, but you understand the position and you understand their argument. And then once you have the understanding, you commit, you commit to certain principles, you commit to maybe joint projects with another religious community in your city. And then you go out there with the E and you engage with one another. So that's a way of activating pluralism. And I think it's much better than um, the alternative, which is tolerance. Tolerance is very standoffish. And I mean, even think about it, Frank, like when you tolerate a behavior of one of your loved ones, right? Like there's something like it's, it's mm -hmm. good. Tolerance is important. I'm not saying it's not, but it's not enough. We have, Correct. we have to do more. Correct. That's fantastic. Is this deuce something that you've come across or it, did you generate? I actually, it? yeah, I actually generated it. I, oh, I wrote that about it so in fantastic. my, yeah, I wrote about it in my first book in 2017 um, it was basically my PhD dissertation and it was published by um, Rutledge, Islam, Race and Pluralism in the Pakistani Diaspora. And at the end of the book, in the conclusion, I was reflecting on my methodology and um, yeah, I, I somehow settled on, on Deuce and um, <laughs> it's really easy, it's, you know, and like, yeah, it's fantastic. I use it. I, I love it. Yeah. I use it a lot with um, younger audiences too. Because a lot of times, yeah. you know, high school students are like, how can we get involved? How can you make a difference? And like, you, you really, as an educator, we have to give people realistic, 
you know, options. And you can't just say, hey, study more or do this, but like Deuce provides you with an actual framework. It's like a, it's almost like a step by step process of uh, getting involved. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. I'm very, I'm glad that we, I stumbled across this because I don't know if I would have come across your earlier. I should have, I probably should have wrote about deuce specifically in the book yeah. maybe maybe the next well next one or okay. coming up yeah um i'm torn right now we've hit we've hit a good length of time here we've touched very little of a lot of the content that i've prepared for our conversation uh especially especially its applicability not only to Christian and Muslim relations, but we're living in an unfortunate time of, uh, of, uh, an, of race relations right now, which are uh, being re-examined and settled sometimes in difficult and even violent ways. And they really need a lot of the insights that you introduce on a different uh, horizon, namely the interreligious one. Um, so, but I think that, I think that we've, inadvertently hit on such a such a valuable point even just at the very scratching the surface to the very first part of your book the, the chapter on uh, on pluralism that I'm thinking to I'm thinking to conclude there rather than trail off on not being able to examine a lot of very important things coming up um, so I'm wonder, I think I'd like to invite you to just say maybe one more thing in conclusion, um, or, and I'll lead in with this. Um, part of your advocacy of pluralism, which I, I, I love that you have moved it away from the kind of the endless theological debate on theological truths uh, because that's a real challenge, mm -hmm. of course, as you know. But uh, activate, to activate pluralism or have pluralism as the way we live is what you said, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. it's fantastic. And then, uh, but in the chapter, you, you uh, challenge Sam Huntington's uh, 2011 class of civilizations work, which I think has been very harmful. Yeah. A lot of people lived by it and adopted it. And you introduce, and uh, I, I'm, I don't think that was your own, but it's a very, it's very, per it's perfect anyway. Uh, dialogue of civilizations as the, con as the contrapoint mm -hmm. to Huntington. It, it, am I correct? Yeah. And what's interesting that you brought this up, um, what's interesting about that is not to digress too much from this book, but that my next book, which I'm, pretty much almost done with now. I got three more weeks to work on it before I have to submit it, but it's called the dialogue of civilizations, Muhammad's interactions with Christians. And essentially my theoretical framework plays with three concepts. Huntington's the clash, mm -hmm. which essentially depicts civilizations as monoliths and civilizations as being kind of inherently against certain civilizations. So Huntington said the West, Western civilization and Islamic civilization are at odds with one another. And like, it's a, it's yes. a very harmful, cool. as, you, as you said. And then right before 9-11, um, former Iranian president um, Khatami went to the UN in New York and gave a speech which was basically responding directly to Huntington. And he said, we need the dialogue of civilization, right. which, mm -hmm. which really is the opposite of what the clash is. But in this book that I'm writing, I've developed and I'm developing a third concept, which is linked to the activation and it's linked to the pluralism that you talked about. And my third concept is the synthesis of civilizations. Oh, beautiful. So I think my issue with um, the dialogue of civilizations, and it, it, I may be nitpicking here, but it's, it's kind of like um, tolerance. When, yep. you, when you enter into a dialogue, obviously very important,
but it doesn't necessarily always lead to something that is mutually beneficial, beneficial or enriching. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying with the synthesis of civilizations, there were moments in time when Muhammad was interacting with Christians in a way it was actually like a, it was a hybrid form of, of being where he was taking things, kind of putting it together, uh, synthesizing and creating something new. That doesn't necessarily happen through the dialogue of civilizations. The dialogue of civilizations may be more about, you know, mutual respect and understanding, but like yeah. the synthesis is like when it's like human beings hitting a different wavelength. And like, we've, we've actually gone even further than mere dialogue. And we're actually finding ways of creating new ways of being. And in the book that Frank, that you read and that we've been talking about, the biggest chapter is actually on seeking knowledge. And I dedicate a lot of time to Sicily and yes. the, the, the history of uh, Islamic Spain. And for yes. me, that is, the synth that is the synthesis of civilizations where you Beautiful. have, you know, with Sicily particularly, you had Arab, Norman, Greek, Christian, Islamic, Lombard, all of these right. different uh, civilizations coming together, creating something new. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and you do a great job of that in the book. And I was educated by that, uh, indeed. Um, so, yeah, the synthesis, um, you know, it, I hope you can see where I'm going with it. Like, it, it, yeah. it pushes people to find ways of, like, taking the best of everyone's traditions and really kind of putting it into a pot, stirring it, and seeing what, seeing what we come up with. Really? Mm -hmm. It's hybridity. Yeah. 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 That's fantastic. And in this book, you have the contributions from both Christianity and Islam and the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, in, in when you are highlighting ideals, like here you're introducing synthesis and you mention the, uh, the work of the prophet um, in, in, in his thought and teaching. Will there, in this new book, is there also similarly Christian, the Christian uh, roots, in, or will it mostly be an examination of the prophet's work and writing and teaching? So the new book, um, it is biographical in nature, but it's also really like a dive into the first 600, 700 years of Christian history. Oh, okay. And um, like the first chapter, I have to go into Christological debates and I have to go to the Council of Nicaea in 325 where Jesus basically becomes divine and the Trinity is created. And then a lot of the, the Christians that Muhammad was interacting with, um, according to the research I've carried out, were essentially heretics of the Byzantine Empire. And oh. you had um, Christian bishops who were um, arguing certain Christological positions. The Byzantine church, based in mm -hmm. Constant uh, Constantinople, they have a council, they create a ruling, and they basically say some Christians are heretics. And they basically, you had communities pushed out all the way onto the Arabian Peninsula. and. Mm -hmm. I try to document in this book, who are these Christians? What did they believe in? And why did I interact with them as he did? I see. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Frank, I really look forward to um, it. Yeah. This book um, was probably the most interesting for me to research. I learned, I think, more about Christianity than I did about um, Muhammad's life or Islam. Going to, um, you know, all of these, as I mentioned, all of these councils in like the fourth and fifth century, these things right. were, were were massively important. I mean, arguably <laughs> yeah, Christianity wouldn't exist as it is today without these yep. councils. And, uh, yeah, right. So yeah, that, that book will be published, um, you know, if, if everything goes according to plan, God willing, it'll be out by this time next year, and it'll be published by um, Hearst in Oxford. Um, mm, wonderful! Congratulations. Thank you. So that's a that's a bit. 
should be a good book, I hope. Indeed. Well, this is fan- fantastic, uh, uh, Professor. I, I, uh, if you listen to all my interviews, every single one, I, <laughs> I never get to, I never get to this long list of stuff <laughs> that I plan to discuss. You could but... talk forever. I feel like you really could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that I think that all of us have benefited tremendously, and I think this will be an interview to listen to for a long time to come. Uh, and, uh, and we'll definitely have to get together and to discuss many of the issues untouched so far uh, uh, that are in this book and, and especially this, this uh, path breaking. I guess on, uh, on television news, people always like want to break the news. You can break the news on our show, but uh, <laughs> we've kind of broken the news here of, the, of, of some of the work that you're doing coming up. Yeah, so, I haven't really... Um talked at much of really i've hardly shared any um knowledge about this this forthcoming book but um oh it's fantastic well we can't wait and we pray pray for blessings over your thank you. capacity to sit still <laughs> uh, yeah not <laughs> yeah. easy not easy yeah, <laughs> yeah. right right but, you know like i'm writing for me is a it's a spiritual act it's it's part of who I am as a religious person and as a, as a Christian. Um, I think, you know, people often think that I'm like this, um, you know, very rigid person who, you know, goes to church every single day and follows a very kind of methodical approach to, to my faith. And, you know, because I, I, I do like writing, um, I actually consider writing, engaging with, scholarship to be uh, a form of, of worship in a way. And I know that may sound very, you know, new age thinking, but um, it's a spiritual act for me. I'm trying yeah. to gain a better understanding of how we, how we got here, who are we as humans? Um, so it's, it's deep, it's deep stuff. And um, I've been blessed. Yeah. I've been blessed to, um, to find something I'm passionate about and um, I'm able to kind of, be alone and write and write and be okay with that. So I'm lucky. Beautiful. I didn't think of new age. I thought of the iconographers that, yeah. you know, pray, pray five times before a single brush stroke. So <laughs> there's no, there's a great tradition of the spirituality of the work. Are you familiar, Frank, with um, the book of Kells? Yes. Yeah. So that, um, you know, I went to Trinity college in Dublin, so I saw the book of Kells a, a bunch of times and, that is the, I guess the the quintessential example of you know, yeah. um, that type of creation of a book or a piece of scholarship as an act of worship. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Oh, this is so thrilling. It's very hard to stop. Well, but this we can has always been a do blessing. It again. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, we surely would. I really enjoyed um, your your thoughtful questions, and um, I just really ap- appreciate. Um, your, your aura and your spirit and even how you speak about it. And you, it seems really thoughtful. And um, I really appreciate that. And the term I like to use is a uh, kindred spirit. And I, I think we're probably kindred spirits, even though we've never met in person. And hopefully that will all change soon once um, the COVID is over. But you're also my neighbor, Frank. You're, uh, I'm in Texas now, but I'm, I'm a Bostonian through and through, and my family's still there. So I'm, I'm sure one day I'll make it to New York, God willing. Yeah, I can't wait. Let, let, we'll pray for that. Thank you. Thank you ch- so much, um, Thank you, Professor uh, Craig. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Look forward to our next time together. Please invite me anytime. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.